Hi, I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to Teach Me to Talk's podcast. Today we're going to be talking about childhood apraxia of speech in toddlers and preschoolers. Now, if a kid is under three, we need to say suspected childhood apraxia of speech, and that's what we're going to be talking about today because it's so hard to reliably identify apraxia in toddlers when they're so, so young. So that's what today's show is about. All right, so let's just start with a definition of what what is childhood apraxia of speech in case that's new to you. Now let me remind you this is a continuing education course for therapists and because it's on YouTube it's also viewed by a lot of parents so we're going to be kind of splitting our time today between talking about apraxia uh, in terms of professionally what we need to know as we evaluate and treat children with apraxia and also from a parent perspective just with what is apraxia? What is this condition that my child has been diagnosed with? So let's go ahead and just start with that and let me also remind you that you can get a handout of today's show so that you can follow along for only five dollars in our five dollar CEU program and teach me to talk and the link uh, for that credit for therapists will be there below and if you're a parent and you just want to get the handout and you don't want to get the continuing education credits you can certainly do that as well too and the link is right here below uh, in the post on YouTube all right so let's just start with what is childhood apraxia of speech? Well, childhood apraxia of speech is a motor speech disorder that makes it difficult for children to learn how to speak. The child's ability to plan the movements for speech is what makes it very, very difficult for them to get the right amount of practice that they need so that they can talk intelligibly and be able to get that word from their little brain to their little mouth. And so that's kind of the parent explanation for that. And so let's sort of break it down so that uh, we can be sure that as professionals we are explaining apraxia to parents so that they understand it. First of all, it's neurological. So what does that mean? That means there's a brain difference. Now sometimes we in early intervention get so scared of talking to parents about things that seem more medical than educational. So if that's you, if you're an SLP, you've probably gotten over that. But if you're another kind of therapist, an early intervention specialist, perhaps your background is in education and you think, I am not really qualified to talk about this with a parent. You need to know though what this basic definition is so that you can answer their questions and you can help your team make decisions uh, regarding what's going on with that child, whether it be for further testing or just basically how your treatment approaches are going to go. All right, and let's talk about, it's a, a motor speech disorder, and again, that means it affects movement, and so speech really is a motor uh, a motor act. We need our uh, parts of our mouth, our articulators, as SLPs call them, our lips, our teeth, our tongue, our cheek muscles. We need, uh, again, it's a, a movement. We need to think about speech not only as a language or a mental process, but there's also a motor component. And again, this difficulty with apraxia occurs in the absence of muscle tone differences. So what does that mean? It means there's not anything wrong or going on with the child's mouth or his articulators, what we've already talked about. And so we don't see any muscle tone differences. Now, let's go ahead and contrast this with another diagnosis that SLPs who work in pediatrics like I do, don't talk about very much, and that's dysarthria. Now, we usually think about dysarthria in the terms of an adult-acquired neurological condition, meaning that uh, an adult had a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, and that can certainly happen to children, too. And we're going to talk about the causes of apraxia in just a minute. But we want to think about uh, contrasting apraxia with dysarthria right now in that dysarthria you can see the muscle tone differences. You'll look at a child's face and you'll see droopy or flaccid, if you want to use a more medical term, uh, muscle tone there. Or maybe they keep their mouths open with that open mouth posture. Those kinds of things are not apraxia. That's dysarthria. And again, the only difference here is with apraxia, we can't really 
really see that there's anything going on neurologically that has affected a child's speech or mouth, but with dysarthria we do because we see those muscle tone differences. And again, that's something that we as SLPs in early intervention don't always talk about, but we know our little guys who have Down syndrome have low muscle tone. Cerebral palsy can go either way with high tone or low tone, but we know when we see those tonal differences, that's not apraxia. And that's one of the reasons that apraxia is so overdiagnosed in a pediatric population is because SLPs, we aren't really, really looking at those definitions. We might be seeing some of these markers for apraxia, but we're not really noticing the number one component, which is absence of that muscle tone difference. And so as an SLP, and certainly as a younger SLP, that was that was more difficult for me because I had not been trained so much in a medical model, more in an educational model, and it was it was more difficult for me to spot those things. But if a child already has a medical diagnosis and you're looking at those low tone things, dysarthria <laughs> is that diagnosis that you're going to uh, want to consider more closely. All right, so there's some difference. Uh, in how we also refer to childhood apraxia of speech if we're looking across the globe. In the United States, apraxia, the professional preferred terminology is childhood apraxia of speech. And I've already said that when a child is under three, we need to say suspected childhood apraxia of speech. Uh, but around the world, apraxia can be called developmental apraxia of speech or developmental verbal dyspraxia. And again, these typically refer to uh, things that a child has been born with, not to things that were acquired, meaning not a stroke after birth or a traumatic brain injury after birth. But again, the inclusion of developmental here uh, leads people to erroneously believe that a child can outgrow apraxia. And so that's why the American Speech Language and Hearing Association has preferred to just go, to leave that developmental term out of it <laughs> so that parents don't get more confused by that or professionals who aren't speech language pathologists. And so we want to think about that too with the terminology that we're even using to discuss a diagnosis with a, a child's family to make sure that there aren't any misunderstandings with that. All right, let's talk about another really important uh, part of apraxia, and it's certainly something that we face in early intervention all the time, and that's is apraxia a child's only issue, meaning that's the primary or the, let's just say the sole reason that he's not talking, versus is, is apraxia part of a child's overall developmental difference or developmental disorder? And so let's kind of talk about these things and, and I'll share with you why I think this is so important to really help parents understand this from the get-go. And so when a child's only issue is apraxia, it's really only going to be a problem with verbal communication or expressive language, expressive speech and language. So getting that message out, just the verbal part. So those kids, when apraxia is the only issue, they have a good understanding of language. So their language comprehension is not in question. They, uh, by the time they're two, are following lots and lots of uh, familiar directions. They can even do some multiple step directions, some two step directions there. So there's no question about whether they understand language. And these are the children too, who have a lot to communicate. And many, many times children with apraxia, when it is their only issue, uh, they just develop elaborate compensations for their inability to talk. So these are the kids who are making up a lot of their own gestures, or they come up with their own little sign language, or I'll do an avowal with a family and we'll talk about some of the, you know, I'll, I'll say, have you started any signs? And they'll say, we didn't start that, our child did. He started doing the same things to represent, or, or the same little gestures to let us know every time he wanted something. So the things were, the, his little hand motions were super specific, and he initiated that. And so that's, those are usually the kinds of things that we see when apraxia is a child's only issue. Now we talked about apraxia can also be a part of a child's uh, communication problem. And so there are going to be other developmental differences too. 
And so these might be kids who also struggle with understanding language. So these are the kids who aren't following directions. These are the kids, too. Uh, we're going to talk about in a minute how often apraxia occurs with autism. And so here's the problem. A lot of times parents will cling to that diagnosis of apraxia because it really just means what? There's just a verbal communication problem versus a diagnosis like autism that a parent might see uh, correctly as an overall developmental difference and there aren't just problems with how that child talks there are problems with how that child interacts with other people so that social interaction piece lots of times there are cognitive issues so a third of the kids who have autism also have uh, cognitive impairments and so they have differences in, in how they learn and in how quickly they learn and we know that anytime there are cognitive differences with a child there will be receptive language delays so it's not just an experience expressive language delay, uh, there's a receptive language delay too. And so we have to talk to parents about that like, you know, no, 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 apraxia is the reason that he's not talking. But when we look at this child's overall developmental picture, there are many other problems that are going on with the communication too. And you could talk about those social interaction issues and those receptive language problems and the cognitive problems. And anytime we see things like that, we know then this child may have apraxia, but there are other things that are going on too. And that is such an important marker because so many times the other issues that a child is experiencing will actually be more important and we'll be more, uh, we'll need to prioritize those issues and working on those issues just as, uh, and we'll be just as dedicated and just as focused to those issues, getting social interaction going, getting receptive language going, those things, in addition to the expressive language piece. And here's something I say on almost every podcast, but in case you're new to my show, I want to say it here for you today. Kids don't learn how to talk until they understand what words mean. And so a lot of times parents, again, will cling to that diagnosis of apraxia because they'll say well that's why language doesn't make sense to him that's why he's not following directions that's why he's not connecting or trying to talk to people and we have to take a step back at that point and say no 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 apraxia just refers to this speech output piece it really doesn't account for your child's social differences or his differences in understanding what words mean and so we have to be super careful when we're talking to parents about that not to hurt their feelings we certainly have to be careful about that but we have to be truthful we have to correct these things that they're saying. So again, why? Because we don't want them making decisions when they have inaccurate uh, information or inaccurate perception. So we have to help a parent get over those humps and, and understand what's apraxia and what might be something else. And so those are conversations that we need to have. And are they difficult to have? Absolutely. And we're going to walk through some of those today in the context of the show as to what you can say or not say. But I want to really, really point that out uh, because so many times we'll just let parents in early intervention think that a child's whole issue is apraxia and then he goes to school or he goes on to another program, he ages out of our early intervention program or whatever's happened and then someone else says, hey, that's not, you know, that's your, your kid has autism or, or what, whatever else happens to be the primary diagnosis. And so we want to be real careful with that in early intervention so that parents again are getting accurate information so all right we've talked about apraxia can be a standalone diagnosis or it can be a part of a child's developmental problem so let's now look at the causes and the causes of apraxia are really closely kind of partnered with some of the things that I've just said about that whether apraxia is a child's standalone diagnosis or if it's part of another problem so when it's a standalone diagnosis, this, this is pr the professional terminology. We say it's an idiopathic neurogenic speech sound disorder. And so again, what do we mean? It, we mean that we can't really see any other kinds of things that we talked about before, any muscle tone or structural differences, but we know there's a difference in that child's ability to communicate. And we also, uh, we call it that too, when there are no other neurobehavioral disorders or conditions, so nothing else, meaning this is it. This child just has, an, has a problem with expressive communication. That, that's the only thing. And so when, we, when we're looking at this cause, we're basically saying, hey, we don't know what's caused this other than there's a neurological difference there. And so that's what we talk about with parents. Causes of apraxia too can be what we also said in, in that it's a part of another 
neurological or neurobehavioral disorder, meaning autism, epilepsy, or a seizure disorder. We see apraxia with that, and why would you know? Again, that's a, it depends on where the seizures are happening in the child's brain if the language center or speech centers are affected. Any other kinds of syndromes, fragile X, Rett syndrome, uh, Prater Willi syndrome, any. Any uh, neurological, uh, Arnold Chiari also has apraxia associated with that. So you'll have to do your research if you're a therapist and you get a new neurological syndrome, like you would always do, and, and specifically look and say, is apraxia going to be a part of this? Is this is this child going to have something that really affects his speech in addition to maybe something else going on again with language, like with, the, with autism? We've already talked about the social interaction differences that we see in those children and for some kids with autism the receptive language difficulties too so that's certainly something that we have to do as SLPs and other kinds of early intervention professionals is really look at is apraxia is this kid at risk for apraxia because of his overall medical diagnosis? And so we have to look at that as well. And apraxia, as I mentioned before, like we talked about with our adult neuro clients, apraxia can also be due to an acquired neurological event, meaning that something happened to a child after he was born or even uh, while he's still uh, in utero. I mean, these kinds of things can happen as well to some, some neurological event. And so a a stroke, an infection, some kind of trauma, uh, cancer, brain cancer, anything like that. A surgery might happen that a child has another condition that he's getting uh, a surgical repair for and then that uh, leads to apraxia because something's happened after that with his surgery. And so there are th those are the primary causes of apraxia. I'll just give you uh, my personal experience in that, I certainly have seen kids in all three of these categories. And so as SLPs, we don't always need to think about apraxia is only something that's that's alone. And again, that's where we kind of get the we, we get the misinformation that apraxia is so rare and only maybe I think the I think the official uh, percentages are three to five percent of children have apraxia, but that's when you're really looking at the standalone diagnosis versus is it a part of something else? And so that's why I wanted to really uh, mention those things to you. Now, as we said, apraxia, because it can be part of something else, we think about that as comorbidity. And again, if you're a parent, that might sound like a term that, that you, you don't use or might be kind of scary to you, but again, it just means that it happens at the same time. And so when a kid has apraxia, we talked about kind of the diagnostic piece of that with the causes, but let's go ahead and look at what the, uh, the, the actual behavioral things that we'll see will be. First of all, with apraxia, we think about apraxia as being a speech problem or a motor speech problem, meaning that the child has difficulty getting that little message from his, planning it to get it from here to here to his mouth to say, and when we know that that's a speech problem, but we uh, apraxia also can coexist with language problems. And so what do I mean by language? Language would be the vocabulary. Language would be, and we refer to that as SLPs as semantics, so the vocabulary piece. It can also be the grammar piece. All the can, uh, child maybe in this early toddler period, they don't they're they're not really understanding how to how to combine words into phrases. It could be a problem with syntax, and so the grammar or even early syntax are going to be things like plurals or uh, uh, things like again verb endings and 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 changing the tenses there of words. And so those are certainly uh, coexisting language problems. But is it part of a praxia? No, it's part of the language. A part of a separate problem. Problem. It's a language disorder, and so we have to kind of keep that in mind too. Uh, you can certainly a kid with apraxia because it's a motor speech disorder. He can also have phonological processes that you're going to have to deal with, and so a phonological disorder. And what does that mean? They don't have all the sounds they want to say because they haven't linguistically learned all the patterns. And again, we know that kids speech-wise aren't going to have all the sounds that they want to say because it's a motor problem. And so here we, we're saying, hey, a kid can have both. He can have the language problem. He can have the, the language problem that's related to the phonological system, that linguistic system is, is um, 
uh, disordered and so he's also going to have that and so again that's going to make it even more difficult for this child to learn how to talk because it's not just apraxia there it's not just the motor speech problem there are other things going on as kids get older apraxia is also really really uh, common or or let's say it this way literacy issues are really really common in children who have apraxia. So you figure out that a kid, the reason he's not talking as a toddler or preschooler is because he has a moderate to severe apraxia. We can expect some literacy issues because we know that these kids also have difficulty in learning how to read and write. And so that certainly is something that we want to think about as early interventionists and get some of those early literacy strategies going because we anticipate that our little friends are gonna have those same kinds of problems too. And as I mentioned before, a big comorbidity with apraxia is autism. And so if you're the kind of therapist that says, I don't really see autism, I don't really treat autism, I don't, I, I don't understand how you can even say that. And when I started practicing back, uh, I got my master's degree in the 90s and started seeing kids in early intervention uh, in the 90s as well. And, you know, at, then you might, maybe you could have said, I don't see kids with autism in early intervention. But now, one in 44 kids, that's what our latest number is uh, from Centers for Disease Control back in December of 2021. They've just published that. And so, in, if maybe, maybe you're the kind of speech pathologist who really doesn't look for that, but you see motor speech disorders more. And so this is what I want to say to you. When you start thinking about apraxia, you need to automatically rule out or at least screen for autism. And so you need to be asking these questions because, and this is what I'm trying to get to, over 60% of children with autism also have apraxia. And so I'm trying to kind of uh, maybe put the, the cart before the horse with this and say, hey, if you don't always see autism, if you can't always recognize autism, but you you see apraxia because speech is your thing, and you know you're that's your thing. Anytime you think a kid has apraxia, you need to automatically try to rule out autism, or at least rule it out from your perspective. Really, do your own individual screening and think. You know, is this a kid who's not also not responding to his name? Is this a kid who has really immature play skills? Is this a kid who might have a lot of self stem things going? Is this a kid who, again, you know, aside from not talking, what other kinds of language issues? Is this kid having? Is this a kid who's having difficulty with nonverbal communication? Not only doing the gestures, but understanding gestures that people are using to him or nonverbal communication. And so you need to go through those little markers. Now, if you need to know early signs of autism, you can get that information in show 430. And I'll try to link that below too, because a lot of times I think we as SLPs miss it. And so I want you uh, to have that information. So when we have a kid, like we said before, that we think, okay, apraxia is just part of this kid's problem. We can't ignore the other pieces of the puzzle. We can't just say, hey, I'm just going to focus on speech here. I'm just going to work on this apraxia part. And that's what parents want you to do because they don't always want to see the other things. Or perhaps, again, speech is their main concern. And so they don't understand. We have to work on understanding language too. We have to get him socially connected because so that he will want to communicate with other people. We have to work on these cognitive skills so he understands more about the world around him. And so that's that's my point here in this whole 15 minute introduction is that you've really got to decide as a professional, is this just part of a problem or is this another part of a bigger problem? And is the bigger problem something that you need to focus on more as an SLP in this, er, in this just very earliest phases of treatment? And so again, I would say when a child doesn't make eye contact consistently, when he's appearing not to listen to or avoid verbal instructions, when he's not responding to his name, when he's avoiding interaction with people who aren't in his little circle, don't think apraxia think autism for those kids. And again, we have to help parents walk through that uh, so that they understand how we're going to prioritize treatment for that child. All right, so 
many parents not in addition not only are they with apraxia are they going to have difficulty with that when there's an autism diagnosis a lot of times they're going to say hey how do you know this isn't just speech delay how do you know he's not just going to outgrow this and so let's just again this gets back to something that I talk about over and over and over on this show and so if you're an SLP or another therapist and you regularly listen to my work and you have not committed this to memory and if this is not something you're talking about or thinking about with families or colleagues a lot I hope today will change this <laughs> because here's what you say to when, when parents ask you that how do you know this or is he going to outgrow this will this be something will he ever talk normally and so this is where we need to have our discussions about delay versus disorder and if you've listened to me talk before you could probably quote what I'm going to say because I say the same things about it every time whether I'm talking to you here on this podcast or whether I'm talking to a family that I'm working with delay just means that there's a problem with time it's just slow everything is coming in as we would expect we don't see any extra stuff like we see in autism with stems or with sensory issues or with with any other kinds of the things that are over in category B with that uh, diag official diagnostic uh, criteria for autism we don't see those things and so that we, we don't see that with a delay it just means it's slower it's just it's language is coming speech is coming it's just not as quick as we would like it to happen. That's delay. And delays, kids do have a big, big chance of come becoming quote unquote normal or getting their communication skills bumped up to within, within that normal range when there's a delay because we can get in there with our interventions, we can make things better, we can speed it up, and certainly kids have a bigger chance of recovering from a speech or language delay versus disorder. Now what's the difference here? Disorder means that things aren't coming in as we would expect. So there is a delay component because that's what makes a parent concerned he's still not talking but then there are other things that we are seeing that make us again pause like what what is that what, what why is he doing that those kinds of things really uh, exemplify a disorder so when we have a kid who does some self simulatory vocal behaviors like humming all the time or when we hear echolalia or jargon that's outside of that normal developmental period where a kid would use jargon when he's one and he's trying to go from single words to phrases or he's again he's got a big receptive vocabulary but he doesn't have a great expressive vocabulary yet and so we kind of fills it in with other sounds because he knows that babies do this because they know that other people talk in these long strings and so again we see uh, with disorders we're, we're, we, we see these extra things or these things that make us pause and so kids aren't going to outgrow disorders like they will uh, delays and again I'm not saying that kids with delays don't need intervention please don't misunderstand me but I'm saying when there is a disorder we know those kids have to have intervention and we know that we're gonna have to really work hard because disorders are the things that usually uh, th that don't go away that you that you're still going to struggle with to some degree now can we is that to say that a kid with apraxia is never going to talk absolutely not and is that to say that you'll get a kid in early intervention who has some markers for apraxia and then at three you're still worried he's going to get that diagnosis no and why is that because that's why we do therapy <laughs> that's our whole purpose right to make kids better and to get the right strategies in the right place at the very beginning you know again at one or at two or at three when their little brains are changing so rapidly anyway and we get those strategies in place and then those kids may look dr hopefully dramatically different now will we still maybe see some quirks here and there maybe but that's the whole purpose of early intervention again to get in there and because of neuroplasticity and to really change that kid's brain and so when we see a kid with apraxia and we are suspecting apraxia that kid isn't on a typical pattern of speech language development he's on a different path with that and so he's got differences again that even a delayed kid a kid with some language and speech language delays isn't going to have that kid's not going to have that difficulty planning and organizing again at, at that kind of brain level that a kid with a speech language delay is and I hope that makes sense to you and we'll, we're going to in just a second start to really look at 
not uh, the specific speech characteristics. So you'll be able to really pick some of these out and to understand how apraxia would be so easily differentiated from a speech or a language delay. And again, these are the conversations you need to have with parents so that they understand, so they're not just relying on the internet for their information, <laughs> so that they can trust you and they can trust what you were saying uh, uh, from an academic perspective. And you're giving them information about apraxia or speech delay or language delay in general, and then you boil it down and make it specific to their kid. All right, I already answered this question. And this is something that parents want to know. As soon as you say apraxia or any other kind of diagnosis beyond delay, parents' next question is, will he be normal? Will she be normal? Will she ever talk like we expect her to talk? And again, that is dependent on so many variables. It depends on the severity of the disorder. We'll see kids who have just a mild motor planning issue. And we are, because of uh, the, the progress we've made in our profession, we are able to help those kids because more intelligible. When kids uh, have more of a moderate to severe, uh, uh, they're, they're affected in that way. We know that, we're, again, we're going to have to work a little harder. And will kids, it also depends on, too, if there's something else going on. Is this just apraxia or is there something else going on with it? So we talked about that comorbidity piece. Another big factor here is frequency of therapy. If you don't get a kid with apraxia in therapy until they're four or five or seven, <laughs> They're not going to do as well as the kid that you got back in this early intervention period when they were one or two or three. And so, again, that's going to make a big, big difference, too. So let's move now and go on and talk about uh, something that I mentioned at the very beginning of the show. And lots of times parents don't understand this. And as speech language pathologists, we don't do a good enough job of explaining it. Why can't my kid get... Uh, for lack of a better word, an apraxia diagnosis now. Why Why are y'all saying <laughs> that he has to be over three? Why is speech pathologist that I took him to at the beginning and I talked to her about apraxia and she said, oh, he doesn't have apraxia. I would never even think about that until a child is over three. My I understand that, and we're going to talk about the problems associated with that and walk through all of these problems, but my problem with that is if we know that a kid has these markers, even if we're not calling it apraxia yet, even if we just have to wait for that third birthday uh, to say apraxia, we still can provide the right kinds of treatment and the right strategies to help that kid move forward. Now, I'm going to say this now, but I'm going to repeat it probably five or six more times before we're finished with this hour-long course. Unless you do the right therapy for apraxia, a kid is not going to get better. And so if you are just doing language facilitation therapy, meaning that you're just going to talk to him and hope it sticks, <laughs> And I'm not slamming language facilitation therapy. I'm not, I'm not doing that at all. But the problem with kids with apraxia isn't language. Unless it is, unless he also has a language delay, and that's that's part of his bigger problem. And again, we've talked about that a lot. But I don't I, I understand a parent's frustration when they're saying, if you know it's apraxia, and if everybody else thinks it's apraxia, you know, why, why don't we just call it that? I hear you. I hear you on that. But let's walk through the other part of this, which is why we have so many problems diagnosing apraxia for kids who are under three. And again, this is pulled from ASHA, the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. It's pulled from their website. They're the organization um, that is responsible for credentialing speech language pathologists in the United States. And so, you know, you have to have met your educational qualifications. You have to have a master's degree. You have to have gone through nine months of direct supervision with somebody else. Uh, and so again, they then they then they give you your official CCC after your name. And so this big organization, and again, that's why I want to say this is because uh, as another professional, you may think, well, who cares if your national organization says, you know, don't diagnose that. If you, if you need to diagnose it, you need to diagnose it. Let's just walk through this. <laughs> and let's just walk through this process and see uh, so that you can understand the controversy here. And so a big problem with not diagnosing diagnosing apraxia for kids who are under three is that they have other developmental disabilities or other, like we've been talking about, other comorbidities. And so again, you don't really want to call it apraxia and be wrong. <laughs> and because there's a high likelihood, and, and we'll talk about this when we're going to walk through the specific requirements for evaluation to uh, 
really officially be able to say that this child has an apraxia diagnosis, so many times that's impossible under three. We're going to talk about those factors, but again, uh, those other factors, but just uh, lots of these issues that a kid will have under three kind of look the same when they all start out. You know, a kid's not talking. It could be apraxia. It could be autism. It could just be speech delay. Can't you know, his sounds aren't coming in right, the right speed, like we talked about, they're slow, or it could be language delay. Semantically, the words aren't coming in. The words are the problem. That's harder for that child to understand. And we said there could be cognitive issues. And so, again, and we haven't even started talking about all those other neurobiological or neurobehavioral uh, diagnoses that I mentioned uh, we have talked about those, but those other uh, neurological conditions, the, the syndromes, all of those kinds of things. And so again, you're going to know those things because those medical pieces, sometimes they take a little while to get get teased out, but they get teased out for those kinds of kids because there are other medical things going on. But if you look at that, just the sheer number of things that it could be, and they all sort of look the same at the beginning, that's one of the big problems. The next problem is the lack of a single validated list of diagnostic features that differentiate apraxia from other kinds of speech sound disorders. And so, again, these might be structural things that have happened. There are neuromuscular differences. We talked about that with dysarthria and our little kids who have uh, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, other kinds of diagnoses that affect their muscle tone. And so, it because of, because of this, we don't have one good list that will say, these are the things, if a kid has this, it's definitively childhood apraxia of speech. We don't have that. And even as today, as we're going to walk through this research and walk through these characteristics, you're going to see uh, from list to list, there's a little bit of variability. And there are even some almost uh, contradictions as we're walking through some of this material. So that's another reason that it's really, really hard to diagnose a child, particularly when he's under three. Uh, the next problem is something that we've discussed, the fact that some primary characteristics of childhood apraxia of speech, like word inconsistency, meaning, hey, I can say a word and then I might not be able to say it again, or, um, I, you know, I can say a word correctly if it's overused, overrehearsed, overlearned, but I can't, you know, a new word really, really trips me up. Some of those things, we see that with apraxia, but we might see those in some other uh, childhood issues too. Another big uh, marker for apraxia is a predominant error pattern of omission. So meaning kids leave off sounds. That's really, really common in apraxia, but guess what? It's common in phonological disorders too. And so again, you can see that, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really hard to differentially uh, diagnose apraxia versus some of the other things that we talked about. A big problem that will prevent us from officially diagnosing a child with apraxia under three is lack of a sufficient speech sample. And so we really can't analyze the kinds of errors that we're making because why? They don't talk. <laughs> And so as early interventionists, that's something that we run into all the time. We might even suspect apraxia, suspect it strongly based on some of these other things that we're going to look at, but we still can't get a kid verbal enough that another therapist, maybe who is specialized in apraxia, who sees primarily children over three, would say, you don't have enough evidence yet. There, he doesn't have enough words for you to be able to do this. And we know that kids need 25 to 30 words before we can start to analyze anything. And if you are an early intervention SLP and you are routinely getting a kid with two or three words and giving them a diagnosis right off the bat based on those two or three words, I, I hope you're not doing that <laughs> because we have to have that core vocabulary. And again, it takes a while for some of our little guys with apraxia to get to 25 words. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do before we even get there. And so that certainly is something that would prevent us from making that diagnosis. And I've already said this, but in just a minute toward the end of the show, we're going to walk through all of the official, uh, I guess if you want to say it official, but all of the necessary components uh, for an evaluation to be able to, again, officially give that child that diagnosis. We're going to walk through that in just a minute. But that, that prevents us in early intervention uh, from making the diagnosis for a lot of kids because we just don't have enough, he doesn't have a big enough vocabulary for us to really be able to systematically analyze it. The next uh, problem, the fifth problem here, is the challenge of sorting out is the is can't versus won't <laughs> 
is this a problem that, that the kid really won't talk to provide the speech sample? And again, this doesn't happen so much with us in early intervention because we know our guy, our little guys and we're in these families' homes and we become familiar with them and lots of times, you know, just they're, they're really, we're part of their families and they're part of ours because we get to know them uh, and we're with them for a long time. And, and again, that just that closeness of being in their homes week after week after week. And so, but this certainly might be something that a, 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 a preschool therapist or a therapist that worked in a more clinical setting would say is I can't really tell if this kid just won't give me the speech sample or if this kid can't talk enough for me to really be able to analyze what's going on with him and so for those of us who don't specialize in itty bitty kids uh, you know that that can look a lot harder uh, and, and certainly is a real issue, but for those of us who see kids, in, who one-year-olds, two-year-olds, and three-year-olds all the time, we have our ways, don't we, <laughs> of being able to get that. But you understand my point here, that a therapist who's not familiar with a child may not be able to, to really differentiate, is this that this kid won't talk, or is this really this kid can't talk? And then this last problem with making the diagnosis for a kid under three is that there are changes happening in speech all the time and little kids systems mature and that's perfect right <laughs> and so you might think this looks like apraxia at two but then by the time they're three and a half or four you've decided that it's not and so that can be unsettling for parents to get that diagnosis for a two-year-old and then uh, have it turn out to be something else. And so we certainly don't want to do that with parents. We want to be able to give them the best information that we can give them uh, as possible. And uh, uh, another big factor that wasn't really really uh, particularly addressed in this list of six, uh, but I guess it kind of would be under the can't versus won't. So many times our little guys in early intervention aren't able to understand the specific directions that we need to give them to even undergo the evaluation. And so we're going to talk about that in a minute when we want, we want a kid to imitate some oral motor movements that we do. And so you do have a hard time deciding, is it that he can't wiggle his tongue or that he doesn't understand the direction, wiggle your tongue, even when he's looking at me, you know, what, what is this real problem here? And so th that, that happens a lot too in early intervention is that we we're having to really sort out, can he even understand the directions to be able to uh, participate with this? And certainly we have the cooperation and the uh, paying attention, those kinds of issues as well. So certainly it's really hard to difficult, or it's really difficult, it's really hard to firmly diagnose a child with uh, childhood apraxia of speech under age three. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. It's just as important in that situation that we make sure that a family has a therapist who's skilled enough with apraxia to be able to do that too, and skilled enough with toddlers to be able to get that participation, get that attention, all the things that we do with our pre-linguistic skills, all those things, you know, is this that the therapist isn't really skilled enough to make this either? And, and parents, you know, as a therapist, that may offend you a little bit if you're listening to the show, but I get emails about this all the time. How do I know if my SLP is on the right track? How do I know? She's told me he doesn't have apraxia or he doesn't have autism, but I'm really thinking that she could be wrong. Those are the kinds of emails that I get. And so certainly we have to make sure that we as professionals understand uh, the techniques and understand these specific markers. So that's certainly another reason for doing this show and walking through this information. All right, so I want to go back and uh, talk to you right now with uh, some evidence-based practice here. And you can find this on your handout. So let's talk about th uh, the characteristics. I was going to say there are three, but that's, that's not. They're going to be four. These four characteristics for toddlers under three who will go on to be diagnosed with apraxia. And this is what this this isn't a list of we're not we're gonna get to the big diagnostic list in a minute, but this is what we're saying. These are the three things that are more likely to help you with differential diagnosis. They have less vocalizations overall, so they're quieter kids, even compared to your speech and language delayed kids, they're quieter even than the kids not only the typically developing kids, but the kids who have speech language delays. They have fewer consonants. That's a big thing. They might talk mostly in vowels. They have a less diverse 
phonetic repertoire. So even they had fewer consonants and guess what? Fewer vowels too. And we'll talk about vowel differentiation in a minute. And then later consonant acquisition. So those were four big things that research tell us tells us that uh, when we see kids under three, those are our biggest ones. Those were the ones that were most consistent. All right, so um, we do want to go ahead now and, and start to look at some other possible symptoms of childhood apraxia of speech too so that you can start to pick out these characteristics. So remember what we just said about the last one. We said less vocalizations overall, so they're quieter kids, fewer consonants. So think about a kid's consonant uh, development there. Fewer vowels, they might just have one vowel and vowel differentiation, even though it's not listed on this, this list is a big one with apraxia. So reduced vowel inventory um, and then later constant acquisition. And so here are the other two that I want you to really, really look for. Increased mistakes in longer or more difficult and complex syllables and words. So the longer the word is, the harder it is for that kid to say. Now, as an SLP, you might be thinking that could just be due, again, to delay, to immaturity. It could, but the, remember the things with, uh, but not as often as it is with apraxia. And remember with apraxia, it's really motor planning motor sequencing and so we see kids once they learn how to talk they still really struggle to get two words together for phrases they still really struggle to learn words beyond that basic consonant vowel vowel consonant uh, cv cv all those really basic word shapes they struggle to get beyond that so consonant blends uh, all, all of those harder uh, <clears throat> pardon me, consonant sounds to R's and L's and TH's, all those things, much more difficult. And it's not just really from the sounds perspective. And I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not talking about this so that you start to get it confused with a phonological disorder. But my point here is the harder it is for a person to say a word, kids with apraxia are going to struggle with it even more and fall apart even more. All right, we talked about the vowels, their reduced vowel inventory, and so that's the number and assortment of vowel sounds that your child can produce or errors with vowels. And I'll tell you what happens with vowels a lot, and I already said it one time, but let me say it again. It's where a kid just has one neutral vowel and he kind of hangs on to it forever. Uh, and it's just really hard maybe for him to get an, uh, differentiate an E or an O or an O, and those are the early vowels that we want to make sure that our kids on our caseload are learning and we'll talk about that next show <laughs> but for right now just reduced vowels so they don't have as many consonants they don't have as many vowels and then another big one that's in some of our list uh, as a big differentiating factor, but it certainly has been for me, would be groping behavior. So the child appears to struggle to get to the correct starting place <laughs> for a syllable or a word. And so you might see this as an SLP. Let's say you were cueing, and I had this on my apraxia phonological disorders DVD. It was a little girl, and she was even under two. But every time I'm cueing her to uh, start a word with her mouth closed, she would always, um, almost always open her mouth and then really close it. And so you can see that groping there. So as I'm cueing, you know, more, let's say more, she starts out with, with her mouth open. And so you'll see that a lot, you know, especially uh, if you're doing some of the diagnostic things that we're going to talk about, you'll see that groping where a kid's with you. It's not that it's attention. It's not that he can't imitate. He's trying, but his mouth, you think you're, you're not even really starting in the right place. You've got to kind of slide there or do some things to get yourself uh, at again with the, the right uh, articulatory posture. And again, I know that's a pretty technical term to use on the podcast, but it's true. And so look for that groping where you'll see a kid is just doing things with his mouth to try to find the way to start the word. All right, so we've talked about those big things for apraxia. And so this this is from uh, Edith Strand at Mayo Clinic, who is a, a big name in childhood apraxia. And this is what she says that she looks for with other markers for uh, childhood apraxia of speech. And she, this is what she says too, that even if we're not officially testing for this in early intervention, we better be looking for it. So these were her big things. She, she really goes with little or no babbling as an infant. So we talked about that. This would go right in with the less vocalizations overall, reduced number of sounds, particularly consonants, and then that lack of vowel differentiation. And so 
Uh, this might be a kid who, let's say that he somehow gets to the phrase level or the little sentence level and we've worked on his language and he gets there. And so instead of, I want cookie, an apraxic kid might say, uh, 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 uh. And so you can see he's taken one vowel. He's gotten the right number of syllables there, but he's just, he's left off his consonants and he's just using that one vowel and he's just, uh, again, you see the differences there. It's not just that there are uh, again one or, one or so little sounds missing. He's missing a lot of consonants there, and then again, his vowels aren't differentiated either. And so, think about that. That's certainly something as a parent or as an SLP um, that you could recognize. Hey, before we go on, I just want to say how grateful I am that you're here and that you are participating in the show. And if you have uh, feel like you've benefited from my videos, please consider purchasing the PDF of this show so that we can continue to make the videos for parents who can't afford that. All right. Other characteristics, back to this topic, other things that I want to mention here, um, and, and these are big things that, again, these aren't as supported in research as the other little lists that we've reviewed, but as SLPs who work in early intervention, these are the things that you may really be seeing. Inconsistent communication in various settings and situations. So if there's communicative pressure, that kid is just going to shut down. That happens a lot with kids with apraxia. It happens a lot with kids with speech-language delays, too, but with apraxia, you can see them and they do have a lot of times, in, uh, especially when it, apraxia is a standalone diagnosis and when these kids have normal receptive language skills, you can see that you can see on their little faces that on some level they know I can't say this and I'm not going to try. This is really, really hard for me. And so you'll see that, um, just that difference in various settings and situations. Also, the connected speech of a kid with apraxia after he's become verbal is much more unintelligible than we would get just on single word or tick test. So you might have a kid that can name some things pretty well for you, but then when he starts to tell you a story or when he starts to tell you about something that happened or when you don't have a reference for what he's talking about, it just falls apart. <laughs> he becomes completely unintelligible. So that's uh, something, too. Uh, certainly kids with apraxia have difficult, more difficulty with uh, self-initiated utterances as compared to overlearned automatic or modeled utterances. And so that's what I said before. When they're trying to really tell you a story as something that they want to get out, you don't really, you're not really talking about with, that with them. So you're not modeling those words or giving them those cues. They really, really uh, struggle with that. Um, a big thing that kids with apraxia also have difficulty with is verbal imitation. Now, I have just done a whole podcast series on verbal imitation, and we're going to do the next two shows uh, for strategies for treating apraxia, so I'm not going to really get into this today. But when we have a kid that can't verbally imitate, but his receptive language is, is within normal limits and his cognitive skills are moving right along, he plays great, he is socially connected to you, he likes you, he likes therapy, but he cannot imitate, think about apraxia <laughs> and look for these other signs and symptoms that you might uh, want to see there. All right, now I've talked a lot about when apraxia is a kid's only developmental issue, and I think I've done that, but I, I want to be sure that I point this out because it's on your handout, and these are things as SLPs that we can look for. So when a kid has apraxia just as his only issue, his gross motor skills are going to have developed on time. So no problems with walking and running because there are no muscle tone issues. No problems with social interaction. No problems with feeding unless we have an oral apraxia that's present too. And again, like I just said in that example, their cognitive skills, their receptive language skills, their play skills are all moving along too. It would just be if there's another diagnosis that's that's also affecting this child when we would see those kinds of difficulties as well. All right, so let's talk about how is childhood apraxia of speech diagnosed. It is best diagnosed by the most qualified professional that family has access to. And usually that's a speech language pathologist because we have been trained in all things related to speech and language. And let me just say this without being, um, I, I, I don't know how to say it any other way other than your pediatrician has not. <laughs> Your pediatrician is trained in medical issues and they look at development only to see 
is a kid on track or not on track? And I have treated neurologist children who will say to me, is this childhood apraxia of speech or is this apraxia? And you would certainly think a neurologist would diagnose these things. And certainly in some sections of the country, I'm talking about the United States now, you may need a doctor to officially confirm a diagnosis of apraxia of speech. But I'm just telling you from personal experience and from reading and reading and reading, <laughs> Doctors don't do it. Neurologists don't do it. You're going to need to see an SLP to really, really get that confirmation of that diagnosis. Uh, so because of those things, because sometimes it's hard to have access to a professional who really understands the practice and who can make that diagnosis, we've already said there can be some problems with it with overdiagnosis. We've already said that uh, we've already talked about that at the beginning of the show where a kid really the best diagnosis would be dysarthria because he has some obvious muscle tone issues versus apraxia. And so a lot of times we'll hear these things like poor speech intelligibility, delayed onset of speech, limited babbling as an infant, restricted sound inventory, and loss of previously spoken words. We'll say that's all characteristic of apraxia, but it could also be characteristic of other things too like autism. And so those things that we've just talked about, even though I said uh, uh, those big time apraxia researchers might still use limited babbling as one of their go-to diagnostic criteria for the things that I've just mentioned. Poor speech intelligibility, delayed onset of speech, limited babbling, restricted sound inventory, and loss of previously spoken words. Those are the things that we don't necessarily need to look at as markers just for apraxia. Remember we said we were going to look more uh, at, at more specifics than we just talked about, uh, that we just talked about previously. Uh, Apraxia, though, can also be underdiagnosed. And why does this happen? Because a lot of SLPs, when they go to grad school, they hear apraxia is rare, apraxia is rare, apraxia is rare. And so they kind of close the book <laughs> on that and think, well, apraxia is rare. I'm never going to see it. That's not what what's going on here. Be that's when the diagnosis is just that standalone diagnosis like we talked about. And in early intervention, we will see kids that, from my own experience, they have really mild motor planning issues. And so they're not ever going to fall into that diagnostic category when they get older because we're going to we're going to get them through that strategy wise and their little systems again mature and I don't want you to think that I'm saying that a kid can outgrow apraxia I'm not saying that I'm just saying that the issue is so mild at the beginning and we get in early intervention we're doing a lot of this motor based speech therapy anyway even if you don't realize you're doing it you probably are and we're going to be talking about that more uh, but again that's why it's often missed in some kids because SLPs think I'm not going to think about this for a kid who's under three. But again, because kids with apraxia require different therapy and honestly more therapy, they need shorter sessions but more frequent sessions to be able to make uh, progress. That's why it's so important to kind of know it from the beginning. All right, so I've talked a lot about this, uh, and I want us to just run through what the components of an evaluation for apraxia are. Now, it's going to be really helpful, more helpful to you if you have the handout for this, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on every one of these indicators, because I want to show you this is what it's listed to get the official diagnosis and why we can't always do this in early intervention, because our kids just aren't going to have this much language. And so let's just move through this and uh, be sure that we are updating our practice patterns. And be sure that if you are an SLP that you feel like, oh, I don't have a ton of, I, I don't have a ton of experience with this yet. I want to see what I can do to make sure that I'm covering all my bases in these assessments. That's what the purpose of this information is. So first of all, let's Let's just start out with some real generic things. The very first consideration that we do anytime a child has a speech or language delay is get a hearing assessment. You have got to have an audiological evaluation to document <laughs> that that child can hear. Kids who can't hear language can't use language. <laughs> and so if you are a parent listening and your child isn't talking and he or she has not had a hearing eval, please get that done. I know he or she probably had that universal hearing screening when they were a newborn, and that's fantastic. But when kids have a history of middle ear infections or whatever, be sure that you were getting that hearing assessment to be sure a child can hear. The second thing that that SLP should be doing to uh, get that evaluation going for a kid that you suspect apraxia with 
is uh, pregnancy and birth history in addition to any illnesses and accidents that uh, mom had during pregnancy that may have affected that anything that's going to pertain to that child's communication delay I would add family history to that too apraxia uh, again has a genetic component we haven't talked a ton about that but you know families will say you know runs in our family so certainly uh, that's something that we see as well and then developmental milestones that's always a part of every early intervention assessment we're going to look at when they walked when they talked how, when did they, all those little developmental milestones that they should have already acquired, we're going to look at that. All right, so then we're going to move to more of the speech or more of the language assessment. So we're going to look language wise at all the verbal things a kid can do and all the nonverbal things a kid can do communicatively. So how does he use eye contact? Does he use gestures like pointing? Will he use eye gaze, like look at an object and look back at you and then look back at the object or vice versa, you object you, so that he's telling you this is what I want you to do. Any kind of communicative behavior, like I said, any of those gestures, they're gonna look at joint attention. We're also gonna look at a child's frustration level. So tantrums, yes, communication frustration is real when a kid can't communicate. So we're gonna look at that and we're also gonna look at shyness and passive uh, you know if they're passive especially with strangers uh, we talked about this before as part of our language assessment we're not only going to look at for a kid who's not talking we're also going to look at how well he understands words not just how well he says words and so uh, that's certainly a big thing and a lot of times parents miss those delays and miss those delays and we talk about that all the time that parents are really surprised that their children don't understand as much as other kids because they just give them credit for understanding everything and so we have to really use our standardized test and use other even informal methods to get a good read on that kid's language if you are not using my 11 pre-linguistic skills checklist from my therapy manual let's talk about talking and you are an early intervention uh, therapist who treats communication I hope you'll get yourself a copy of that book because those 11 skills are just critical for looking at how ready a child is to talk and so that's certainly part of our uh, language assessment here uh, the next part is that we need to be looking at kids mouths and that is hard in early intervention for kids who were one and two and so we want to try to see if there are any structural differences and again sometimes that's harder for us as early intervention SLPs but sometimes you'll realize you know with a kid that you haven't gotten to see uh, you might see some structural differences and that's outside of apraxia that has that's that's not apraxia but you certainly uh, want to want to be sure that you're looking at those structures all right now these are the next parts that are also hard for early intervention therapists but absolutely necessary to get an apraxia diagnosis you have got to compare how a child has automatic control of the oral motor structures and what does that mean how does he move his mouth and things he does all day every day so look at his mouth when he's eating so how does he bite how does he chew how does he swallow how does he do things like kiss like does he pucker can he blow bubbles uh, those kinds of things children with apraxia can complete those kinds of things no problem don't generally have feeding problems don't have problems with those familiar movements kids who do have those kinds of problems generally have muscle tone differences so again the diagnosis for those kids is going to be what dysarthria not apraxia and so we have to really see uh, if dysarthria could be contributing to this child's issue not just apraxia all right so after we've looked at those automatic movements like eating and those little things we do like kissing blowing bubbles all, all those little things we do in our mouth then we're going to look at volitional nonverbal movements so these would be the oral motor movements that we want them to imitate so this is oral imitation now this is a part of the diagnostic process so we have a kid try to stick his tongue out try to lateralize his tongue try to you know uh, pucker his lips try to open and close any of those things in imitation of us children with apraxia as toddlers will have so much difficulty doing that but you have to differentiate that is this just that this kid is not going to listen he's not going to stay with me he's running away because of that or is it that this kid is sitting here trying and just can't do it and so uh, again you're going to have to have a kid who can imitate pretty well and if you'll see if you have listened to my uh, building verbal imitation skills in late talkers that podcast series I just did about teaching late talkers to imitate we walk through that whole 
process. And so that treatment method is exactly what I use for kids with apraxia. And so these things, this diagnostic process, this is different from treatment, but you'll start to see even in the, in, uh, the evaluation that kids can't do this. They're not able to copy any of your face or mouth movements. So you want to compare that. The next thing you want to do is compare their, uh, those kinds of movements, the things that we just did, but now you add sound with it. So can they uh, do some little early play sounds, like some sound effect things? Can they blow raspberries with the voice? Uh, can they, uh, again, you know, do a la 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 la, you know, not just click their tongue or elevate their tongue. Can they pair it with sound? And this is so hard for our little guys with apraxia. Another thing that kids with apraxia have a real hard time doing is altering the motion rates. And so it's hard hard for them if you say that you want to do something fast and then slow, it is hard for them to uh, control that variability there. And so they may, they may be able to say, uh, let's just say uh, water, 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 but then you try to have them say water, 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 or even a multisyllabic word like butterfly, butterfly, butterfly. And they would have a hard time slowing it down to butterfly 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 and so we have we have some real differences there uh, this also goes along with what we as SLPs call our diadococinetic rate and you'll remember from grad school Putica, 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 and we use that because we want to pair consonants at the uh, different with a vowel at uh, varying places in the mouth. So you start with the the consonants that are made toward the front of your mouth with a p, and then you move to mid mouth with a t, and then the back of your mouth with a k. And so putica, 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 and kids with apraxia or adults with apraxia or anybody <laughs> with difficulty with sequencing with motor planning that will be really really hard. And so just like we talked. About about in the last uh, indicator, kids with apraxia are going to have a lot of difficulty repeating those syllables as quickly and without making those errors. All right, as we move on with this speech assessment, or this uh, speech language evaluation for apraxia. The next, all these 13 through number 18, all have to do with analyzing how a child produces sounds, syllables, and words. And again, you can see as an SLP and early intervention, many times we do not have any sounds, <laughs> syllables, and words to work with. That's the problem. The kids aren't talking. And so you have to have, like we talked about before, a base vocabulary before you can really, really look at this because you've, you've got to look at things like co-articulation. What's co-articulation? That's the effect that a consonant, the place that a consonant is produced in your mouth would have on the next consonant, that, that next consonant that's coming up in the word or the vowel. And so we have to think about that. And again, without a lot of words and without multisyllabic words, we are not going to be able to compare that. So that's why this is going to be so difficult uh, to diagnose apraxia in a kid that's under three. Uh, so look at those. Look at that on your handout. Um, ability to articulate phonemes, syllables, and words. Production, imitation of vowels during co-articulation. So we talked about that. Do their, does their vowel hold its integrity? Meaning, does the E sound like an E? When he gets a child gets going in longer utterances, so in a phrase, in a sentence, in a paragraph, will are his vowels as clear and as crisp as they are in single words? So that's certainly something we can look at. Production or imitation of multisyllabic words. How intelligible is the child just in a, a language sample? And then let's talk about this prosody. So one of the markers of apraxia is that a child will have difficulty changing his rate, his intonational pattern, or his intensity. And so that would be, you know, we talked about the volume. Uh, we talked about the rate. That's what we already talked about. We talked about fast versus slow. He'll also have trouble kind of regulating his volume whether he should be speaking uh, softly or loudly and that intonation pattern meaning the, the rhythm or the stress and so lots of times uh, kids when they'll start to really talk they mess up the stress in a word so a word like baby they might they might say baby or baby and again they don't get that appropriate stress there and so uh, kids with 
apraxia can also sound monotone or robotic or choppy and so prosody matters and so if you're thinking something is just off with this kid and I don't you know it's an older child who's already talking think about the prosody start to really analyze that and a lot of times we don't do that in early intervention uh, we want to look at our error patterns so when we're analyzing for our vowels and our consonants, particularly our consonants. Kids with apraxia really have inconsistent errors. And I think I started talking about this before and I've got such good examples of this on video where a kid's trying to say Elmo and every time he says it, it's different. They might say elbow, they might say Momo, they might say Emmo, they might say Emma, they might say Omo, and, and all those different productions that I just uh, gave you right there, that might be within one session and so those in that inconsistency every time he says a word unless he really owns that word unless it's over learned overused over rehearsed he says it a different way every single time and so that's certainly uh, something that that we want to think about when we're uh, doing our assessments and and that's something that we'll see in early therapy too and a lot of this stuff that we've talked about as early interventionists, we're seeing these kids, again, without making these diagnoses, without it even really sort of being a diagnostic. You know, we start on intervention, but these are the things you're going to notice over the first few weeks or months that you work with them. Uh, you know, oh my goodness, he says a word different every single time. Oh, his vowels. He gets vowels in single words, but his vowels fall apart when he starts trying to do phrases. Uh, you'll, th those, he, he can't really sequence. If, if he's talking slow to me and I, he's telling me something that I know what he's talking about, I understand him, but then, you know, he has some rate issues when he gets real excited and he, he has no consonants. Those are the things that you're gonna see, not only in this diagnostic portion, but as as we help kids get words <laughs> as you teach them words you know you'll start to notice these patterns and and you'll start to think you know apraxia is certainly something uh, that could be going on with this kid uh, the 19th component of an evaluation for apraxia is communicative impact so we talked about that briefly frustration is extremely common in kids with apraxia who again it's their standalone diagnosis because they know on some level I can't say that and I should be able to say it and, and I can't make people understand me and this is really, really frustrating for me. So we're certainly going to want to indicate that. And then at the end of this, clinical impression differential diagnosis. And we've already talked about whether a kid has a delay, a disorder, which one is it? Is it apraxia? Those are things that we... Uh, that we're going, you know, do we have enough information to accurately make that diagnosis? And so that that's uh, what we want to do there too. All right, I want to spend just about one minute wrapping up this show with what we're going to start with for the next two shows. In the next two shows, we're going to look at treating toddlers and preschoolers who have suspected childhood apraxia of speech. Today's show was super academic, and we looked at a lot of list and studies, but we're not going to do that for the treatment protocols but uh, and, and the treatment strategies that I found to be so effective. But let me just tell you what are going to be the most important treatment approaches for any toddler or preschooler with apraxia. We have got to prioritize language, meaning that we've got to get them saying something so that they can communicate. A lot of times that means number two, we're going to introduce an AAC system. We're going to get signs or pictures or a speech generating device going so that those children have a way to say what they need to say. I like signs better than anything or body movements because I feel like that kids can take those systems with them anywhere and we are working on motor planning with that. We're working on getting signals from our brains to our hands and that also uh, will uh, help with motor planning so that kids are developmentally ready to talk and we're moving them in the right direction to get that motor planning and that motor sequencing, get those systems fine-tuned. And so Signs are certainly a part of that. And then we have to emphasize motor treatment principles like cueing, like shaping, like mass practice. And then our last uh, treatment recommendation that we're gonna talk about is we'll use linguistic approaches when needed. And so that means that we're gonna address their language just as heavily as we would with their speech. And I know that that probably is not gonna make a ton of sense to you in this show, but by the time we get to the next show, you're gonna know exactly what that means. 
All right. I thank you so much for joining me uh, for today in this introductory show about recognizing apraxia in toddlers and preschoolers. And I hope you'll join me for shows 432 and 433 when we get to the really fun part, which is treatment. All right. That's it for today. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and you've just joined me for Teach Me to Talk's podcast. Thank you.